Vikram, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Thrilled to be with you. Where do we you. find you in 2021? Tax day, or at least tax, tax day for the last 100 years, not anymore. Tax no, day is now in May, it. but pushed April 15th, it. where are you? <laughs> I'm in Massachusetts today. Lexington, Massachusetts. So today, we're going to talk a lot about some topics that are near and dear to my heart. How to think for yourself, booms, busts. I wanted to start, however, with stadiums i'm a broncos fan and and our mile high stadium has been named like five different things stadiums and, and buildings i think is a good place to start talk to us a little bit about stadiums and buildings I, the, the reason this is front of mind is i think it's a miami stadium just got named after a crypto firm uh, talk to me about what uh what, what, what am i talking good, about does here? it <laughs> Yeah. Look, I mean, let's go back. I'll, I'll talk in terms of uh, skyscrapers and buildings there, and then we can sort of extrapolate from that. But look, these are literally monuments, right? I mean, we're, we're sort of talking about the fact that people are trying to, at this stage, gather attention through physical buildings and, and monuments, sometimes to particular companies or to particular um you know, someone trying to hold a crown and sort of say, look at me, look what I've done. Um, so let's go back and just think a little bit about the history of buildings and skyscrapers. And we know that even going back into the early 1900s, even in the 1800s, that skyscrapers, when they hit sort of world tallest status, predicted financial calamities. I mean, with pretty good regularity. So let's not go back that far. Let's just go back a pretty good time to the Great Depression. In 1929, we had three buildings competing for the world's tallest tower in New York City. You had 40 Wall Street. Then you had the Chrysler Building, which erected that spire on top of it precisely to take the title. And then you had the Empire State Building being built. And by the way, that didn't get finished because the Great Depression hit, but they were trying to get the title. Um, and so yeah, then you had the Great Depression. So that didn't feel good about that competition. Roll the clock forward, 73, 74, we had the Sears Tower World Trade Center, a decade of stagflation and economic chaos that really felt to many like a bubble bursting. Roll the clock forward even further. The title leaves North America and goes east, goes to East Asia. 1997, the Petronas Towers take the title as the world's tallest freestanding structures. And by the way, they took that title in 97, right before the Asian financial crisis hit, right at the ground zero of the Asian financial crisis. So again, there's something eerie going on here. 1999 into 2000, they started construction of Taipei 101, uh, which became the world's tallest tower, I think in 01 or 02. Uh, but nevertheless, the ambition was there and that marked the top of the tech bubble. That was the home, at least in the hardware sense, if you're talking foundries and semiconductors of the tech bubble. Um, and then in 2007, in July, actually, of 2007, within weeks of global equity markets peaking, the Burj Dubai claimed the title of the world's tallest freestanding structure. That marked, you know, yet another one of these things that sort of hit the cycle. And you're like, wait, what the heck is going on? So there's a couple of things going on here, which is the reason why I think it's a fun indicator that I pay attention to when I look at bubbles. Number one, banks have to feel confident. Number two, you have to have a speculative instinct alive and well. That Those juices need to be flowing, right? Because if you don't have those speculative instincts going, these are mainly developers saying, hey, let me build it and hopefully the tenants will come. Even the Patronus Tower needed tenants, even though it was a major company building it, right? And you're not hearing about things like, oh, Exxon Mobil's building a new world headquarters, world's tallest tower, we're going to occupy the whole thing. No, you need to get tenants. So they're speculative. And lastly, as I started with, there's a little bit of chest thumping behavior here. This is hubris, overconfidence embodied, right? And, and let's roll the clock forward to say, hey, where are the world's tallest towers going to be? Because we can look at announced plans today. And what you see is that they're going back to the Middle East and they're getting bigger, right? So Saudi Arabia announced a one kilometer high tower that they were going to build in Jeddah. Uh-oh. I mean, you want to quite literally a castle on the sand. I mean, it's literally you're building castles in the sand. This is a desert. You're building, like, if you're going to build something that high, do it so you can see something, right? At least you got sand followed by water. I mean, I want to do it like you know, see the Himalayan mountains and India should build it, but they don't. Um, and then 
not to be outdone, uh, the folks in Dubai um, said, hey, hold on a sec. We're not giving up that title to the Saudis. Uh, we're going to take it back. Dubai Creek Tower was announced to have a 1.3 kilometer uh, intended height, 1,300 meters straight up in the desert. Like this is actually saying something. There's something going on here. So easy money, yes. Speculative instincts, yes. Hubris, yes. Those are three really telltale signs of excesses. It's it's um as evolved and rational and logical as humans, I think, really like to think they are. I mean, this this genetic wiring of, I mean, you know, going back to pyramids thousands of years ago and here we are in 2021 and still running through the same scripts <laughs> that we have been for forever and uh you know i mean you can dial it down onto a micro level too right keeping up with the joneses here in los angeles the the housing boom is well underway uh it seems like talking to my broker friends and every house has 20 30 bids all above uh offer and um, but even, you know, I can think back to being a child and it being somewhat hardwired, maybe cultural, but man, that beautiful red Lamborghini Countach of the 80s, <laughs> the Corvette, maybe, I don't know. Um, but it's funny because I, I started with the stadiums and, you know, yeah. sentiment's always challenging for me. Uh, but, but looking at, um, there's an old Victor Niederhofer study that looked at stadium naming for public companies and then future performance yep. same thing with skyscrapers and not surprisingly it's uh it's it's atrocious but talk to me a little bit about uh you had a great book boom bustology uh it was a really fun read thinking about a topic that i think people love to marinate on which is bubbles give us some criteria uh okay. for yeah. for how you think about a framework for identifying them characteristics, all that good stuff, how to avoid them or how, in my opinion, get caught up in them. They're a lot of fun. I, I graduated university in the nineties, my favorite bubble, internet bubble. That was a fun time. If you're in San Francisco <laughs> in, in a 98, 99, talk to me a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, it's interesting. Let me, uh, before I do that, let me just add one tidbit to your prior question about stadiums and, and corporations and stuff like that. I just love the fact that Bear Stearns built a monument to themselves. What, 2007? I think it was like 2007, six, seven. They were, they had a perfectly capably functional, useful, not even a bad address. 245 Park Ave is not a bad address. Great location. They moved two blocks away and built a beautiful, nicer, newer, shinier spectacle at an ungodly cost. Um, and that didn't end so well. And by the way, you got this with the New York Times. You got a lot, long number of them, but any case. Um, so yeah, look, thanks for bringing up a boom bustology. It's a framework. Uh, and it was designed as a framework for thinking about bubbles because it goes back to a deep philosophy I have, um, which has infused all my work, which is every lens, every perspective we have is biased, incomplete, and limited. And as such, it's kind of arrogant to think that one approach is the right approach. And so what we need to do is think probabilistically and layer these lenses on top of each other. And only when you start getting a bunch of lenses pointing in the same insight, can you say, maybe we've got something. There's nothing certain. We know that. Now, this is a game of probabilities and odds. And so what I did was, you know, I started teaching about financial bubbles to liberal arts undergrads at Yale University. I had English majors, biology majors, history majors, as well as economists, computer scientists, et cetera. And I said, look, we're going to take this issue of financial bubbles as a probabilistic phenomenon and study it through multiple lenses. And that's what we did. And so there's obviously the economic lens, right? So lens one price action. If you have supply and demand curves intersecting, you should get a price. But what happens when higher price generates more demand rather than more supply? You normally think more supply should come. Higher prices, more supply, less demand. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes higher prices get more demand and you start getting a self-fulfilling cycle, right? Sort of higher prices, more demand, higher prices, more demand, higher prices, more demand. And so that doesn't make it a bubble, 
but it sure sounds and smells like a bubble dynamic and one that we want to pay attention to. So let's just put a check mark if you see that. Doesn't mean you got a bubble. Lens two, what happens if you got capital being invested? So let's look through a macroeconomic lens. What happens if you see credit conditions such that you get money mispriced or you know underpriced generally? It's rarely overpriced. So if, if money's mispriced, it's overused, right? So mispriced money is misallocated money. That's one of the phrases I keep coming back to. And if you see that very visibly in the form of investing using borrowed capacity, borrowed capital when there's already overcapacity, anyone who's ever been to Las Vegas can go to Las Vegas. And if you were there in 2006, seven, you knew that there were like low vacancy rates, lots of lots and lots and lots of real estate development going on, more condos, more construction, MGM project cities and all that stuff's going on. But there was no shortage of available capacity and supply, right? So we're borrowing money to invest in more. That's not a good sign. So uh, then there's a psychology lens, as I talked about, sort of herd behavior, overconfidence, hubris, et cetera. You know, when it's different this time, it usually is different, but the extrapolation of the different things to a different way to think about valuing them that's usually problematic, right? I mean, in all bubbles, you usually have a, this time it's different story, right? Whether it was going back to, geez, the automobile, radio, going through, you know, obviously your favorite bubble, uh, the internet sort of, it's different this time, it's gonna change the world. You know, social media is gonna change the world or, or what have you. There's always a storyline that's believable and usually has some kernel of truth to it, right? I mean, the internet did change the world. I mean, how many of us buy a book by going to Borders Bookstore? I mean, some of the listeners here may not even know what Borders Bookstore is. Mm. Probably too young. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, that's just... So lens three would be psychology. Lens four that I talk about in my book is politics, right? We know there are things like, you know, the Community, Community Reinvestment Act, I think it was, or sort of, uh, I forget what it was called, but there were, there were government policies that actively sought to promote home ownership, that pushed it above what might have been natural or normal creating a you know rigidity in labor market conditions or or encouraging banks to lend to frankly not lend worthy borrowers um, you know doing things between subsidies or or, um, or or tariffs but manipulating supply and demand for political reasons um, can create artificial conditions where things don't clear right and that creates problems uh, and can create both bubbles as well as busts and sort of confuses the dynamics, but enough to raise your guard to say, hey, hold on a sec, there's something going on here. There's false propping up of a market or false propping down, you know, and think about political manipulation there and the moral hazard it creates, right? I mean, if it's heads I win, tails you lose, maybe I'm playing that game with you all day long, right? And by the way, that's what some of the Wall Street banks did. They played heads I win, tails you lose, you being the taxpayers of the world or of America um, in the case, uh, as we saw. And then the, the, the fifth lens I use in that book, at least, is uh, herd behavior. Um, and, you know, you sort of talk jokingly about sort of cocktail party conversations or what the shoeshine boy used to say. But when everyone's focused on a topic, you know, your, your broker friends talk about 20 bids, that's the same conversation I'm hearing here in Massachusetts. Houses are going well over ass, five bids, 10 bids, you know, 30% above asks. What? 30%? Yeah, I went 30%. These are the stories everyone's harping on. Or I just made X million dollars in Bitcoin or, you know, what have you. These conversations, when they pop, capture popular sentiment, they're usually a late, late inning indicator, right? Uh, so what it means is that eh, you basically run its course most of the way, maybe not all the way, I can't tell you when exactly, but the amount of, you know, the, the, the sort of fuel to pour on the fire is running low. So you know that's that. what I described in the book, Meb. And, you know, subsequent to that book, I've added lenses and there's more than lens, more. There were five lenses and five case studies in the book. And the only reason was five was a nice round number. My view is the more the merrier, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I've, in the past, I've talked about a cultural lens, you know, when you see cultural homogeneity and you saw that in some of the Asian cultures, you know, there's other lenses you can bring to bear. Yeah, the, uh, the 90s was certainly the most fun for me as a participant and uh, instructive in retrospect. It was certainly painful, you know, the, the aftermath for, for many, uh, you know, at the time for me as well as, as, but looking back, I have fond memories, but 
uh, you know, the, the favorite profile of mine in your book, particularly for an investment lens that just has so many uh, takeaways is Japan, you know, I mean, even that, so the U.S. bubble, stock market bubble in the 90s, we love talking about long-term valuations. Well, the highest it had ever been before was in the roaring 20s when the 10-year PE ratio got in the 30s. And then we blew right through that and got to 45, which is the highest the U.S. has ever been. But in Japan, uh, that was quaint. They got almost to a PE <laughs> of 100. And, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that was, and again, not a tiny economy, the biggest stock market in the world at the time. Um, yeah. As well, you even, have, hmm? I was going to say, man, it's even better than that, right? Think about what they did with the mortgages. They went to hundred-year mortgages, right? Because valuations got so high, you had to spread, like even on real assets, everything. It was ludicrous. And that had kind of the trifecta of you know the the kerosene and everything to pour on the fire that you talk about in the book, with particularly you know credit and borrowing. That one, a, a big real estate and stock market, you know, at the same time, uh, and, and commercial real estate too, uh, that has had three decade, you know, um, implications on, we're big, I'm a big skier in Japan, and uh, we go ski some of these quasi abandoned resorts where they built hundreds of ski resorts and golf too. <laughs> now, maybe, maybe we'll see the, all those get put to use after, uh, um, they claim their first uh, master's title uh, from yeah. Japan recently. As you look around from these historical case studies, is it informing anything uh, around the world today? You mentioned some of the buildings in Asia. Are there any investment markets, anything else that uh, seems to be tripping up some of your uh, criteria, your lenses? Yeah. yeah, you know, I do worry about the mispriced money dynamic. And I think that surfaces, unfortunately, in lots of places, right? I mean, I think, you know, there's a reason why U.S. real estate markets are going crazy. I, 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 I suspect, I might be wrong, I suspect a contributing factor is the low cost of borrowing money. I suspect a lot of liquidity in the system means banks have to feel like they got to find places to deploy that capital. And real estate historically quote before 2008 it was as safe as houses was the phrase right but like <laughs> i think we learned a little lesson actually things correlate there too um and the sort of separation of risk and the financial engineering that took place so you know i get a little worried when i see things like that from a lens of housing but then again the u.s market or u.s economy might be bouncing back with some pent-up demand and you know maybe there's a a, a new wave of government-led investment. So maybe there's activity, maybe it's justified. I don't know. I'm not uh, about to go and, and up my real estate exposure uh, at all today. Let me just put it that way, right? So, um, and actually that, that's a useful topic to raise uh, because I think, look, the investing game is about managing the errors you make. My interpretation is that we're gonna all make errors but we can choose whether we're going to make an error of commission or an error of omission. And right now, the error of omission is to miss gains. And the error of commission is to try to ride that last X percent and you go flying off the edge. And I just think there's times when you want to choose which error you're going to make. And the error to make today, I would suggest, is more the omission rather than the commission error. Um, sometimes when things are beaten up, you make the commission error. Hey, things are cheap. Will they get cheaper? They might. It's going to go against me. And I'm going to take that risk because that's okay. I want to get the, you know, hitting the bottom. And even if I ride it down, I'm going to ride up because I feel like I've got a perspective that gives me that insight. And that's where, you know, to go back to your analogy of Japan's at a hundred times, there's times where certain markets are down mid to low single digits, right? In the emerging markets, you've seen that for sure. And you say, hey, hold on a second make the error of commission there, right? You might not get it right. It's going to go against you. That's okay, right? That's okay. Um, so that's one area. Um, secondly, I think if you look at what's happening with some of the cryptocurrencies, um, which a lot of people ask me about, hey, these bubbly, what's going on? And I said, well, there's signs of overconfidence, et cetera. But cryptocurrency like gold, to me, 
and again, a crypto is not a crypto is not a crypto. So let's, we can disentangle that or peel that onion if you want. Um, but generically, those are things I think of almost as anti-assets rather than assets, right? So it's, they're, they're sort of the alternative to something that you think of as an asset in the sense that one divided by your faith in fiat currencies can be the way to think about non-printable currencies. And I think of gold or crypto, generically crypto, we'll get to the specific if you want, as non-printable currencies. Um, and if they're non-printable, then they're not subject to the political manipulation. They're not subject to the monetary debasement. They're not subject to some of these things. And so scarcity value should, in fact, actually come home and therefore they should play a role, I don't know, debate how large a role in portfolios, right? So I'm less concerned about calling things like gold or crypto a bubble than I am about thinking, has fiat currency become a bubble? You know, have we gone too far with our belief that we can print, print, print? Maybe not. Maybe the U.S. has this exorbitant privilege of being the reserve currency, the, you know, the ability to print. Uh, and people want to take our paper, like, okay, well, if you got that, take advantage of it, right? Build infrastructure. I'm thrilled to see infrastructure spending because that, if, we, if we've got a limited runway, let's use it to do things that'll help us in the future, right? Like infrastructure. So, um, you know, that, those are some thoughts. I'm sorry for, for, for meandering around here. <laughs> I don't know if you're still no, listening. <laughs> it's good. And um, I'm just spinning in my head as you're talking, you know, thinking about history and we're talking about you know building monuments and even but thinking about currency and you know money has been around for thousands of years but the concept of our modern system yeah 50 years for floating uh currencies you know in the scope of human history not that long uh and so we love talking about trying to you know derive uh lessons for investing from history and even we go back what i consider to be a long way of 100 plus years but that's you know in the scheme of things a, a, a speck of sand in the hourglass so uh who knows i i always say that things can get weirder and crazier in the future by definition uh and uh you know the 2020 and 2021 seem to be uh you know doing a good job of that thus far with uh GameStop and Reddit and Wall Street bets and SPACs what's the, what's the vibe you know you you have been a lecturer you interact with a lot of students and people yeah everyone uh talking about that topic du jour still uh what's everyone sort of yeah so it's a fascinating question that the whole idea of student sentiment and what it telegraphs i it's it's an area of personal interest i paid a lot of attention to and so i remember look i was teaching at yale i was a yale undergrad and you know i studied chinese and east asian studies when i was a yale undergrad and that was a contrarian move because everyone thought japan was taking over the world mm -hmm. right this is the early 90s japan's taking over look they just bought sony they're just buying pebble beach they're doing like they're doing everything and i was like well you know china's got more people like maybe i'll study that it's sort of more interesting and so i studied china um the student sentiment in 2000, 2008 and nine, when I was uh, teaching at Yale, the most popular language to study was Chinese. Hmm. Oh, interesting. The most popular language in the early 90s was Japanese. Like, oh, okay, hold on. What's going on here? Is it a trailing indicator? Is it an indicator of something else? I don't know. Um, the other thing, professionally, as you know, when I was an undergrad and even my early years of teaching, investment banking, consulting, asset management, private equity, those were the hot things. Now, yeah, I'm going to a tech startup. I'm going to go do some science. I'm going to get, right? And so we've seen cycles of that too, right? That happened in the late 90s. People like, hey, you know, forget about investment banks. Those are too traditional. Those are stayed. Those are risk averse people who go there. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to the startup land. That's where this, the real action is. Um, and so you've seen some, some bouncing back and forth. The other thing I'd say, it's interesting. I think post the global financial crisis, a bunch of students just don't seem as motivated, at least the, maybe they're, maybe they're self-selecting because they come to study the topics I teach, but a bunch of them seem less motivated by just let me go build a pile of capital 
and cash for myself and let, there's sort of this desire to change the world. And some of that's infused in this values oriented way through startups and social enterprises and whatever else, social investment or social entrepreneurship, whatever they call it. But there's a definite noticeable vibe in the student population that I got to do something that matters. I want to like, and if it's like, hey, I got to do something that's being done today, but do it differently and greener. Okay, great. Or I want to do it in this way because this is going to help the indigenous people of blank. Great. Or I want to do something that's really harming water and overusing water. Okay, great. But there's this sort of do good angle to it all. It doesn't mean they give up on the idea of making money. They just want to make money doing something positive. And there's more of that I sense there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, I talk a lot about this on the podcast where I'm, I'm pretty vocal about the broad U.S. stock market and kind of the way that we see it as, as being expensive and lots of sort of ancillary uh, sentiment indicators starting to fire, including one where I tweeted about stock market valuations last night and, and everyone's like pretty angry about it. <laughs> responses, maybe the people that agree just don't respond, but all the responses were, were kind of angry. I said, the U.S. stock market is hitting a valuation level We've only seen like three times for the big indices. So foreign developed in uh, 89, 90, or sorry, 88, 89, 99, emerging hit at no seven. And the late eighties was really that Japanese story, right? Europe and elsewhere was reasonable. And then the U S of course, in in uh, 99, and then today, not even in 29. And uh, I said, usually, at least historically, the future returns were zero. And man, people got kind of angry about it. Um, well, I love also. Go ahead. No, sorry. I was going to say, you know, that what you're pointing to with these valuations. And then, as you asked in an earlier question, I didn't answer the whole idea of SPACs and what's going on in SPAC land. I mean, it's funny, I on my webinar series, and I have a webinar series and podcast I host, and I had Jeremy Grantham on um, in December, and he he was fabulous about it. He's like, SPAC should be illegal. This is regulatory arbitrage. This is like someone should be at, and he literally, I think he, I don't know if it was during that webinar or in a private conversation I had with him, but he talked about, he's like, SPACs are the model, modern day, like Mississippi company type stuff, right? Uh, or East, you know, whatever the, uh, the bubble was, the... Uh, uh, this is, this company's so good and we're going to make so much money. We just can't tell you what it is yet. Like, okay. Like that's the SPAC story. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this it's is such a old good as time, 300 year old, you know, I'll see. Lessons Excuse me. I'll see. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so weird to me. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I get the, the various parts of the SPAC story and, and why people would participate in each part. Um, but uh, you certainly have a history of SPACs being a total cash incinerator post deal consummation. Will this be different? I hope so. You know, maybe the pedigree and the companies and the selection incentives aligning, hopefully that creates a, a better uh, outcome for investors. But historically, it's been an absolute just dumpster, like minus 70% or something is the average post consummation return. So listeners yeah. beware. It doesn't mean you can't make a lot of money there, but um, it's, yeah. uh, it's been crazy to watch. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I'd add to that is some bubbles leave really good wake for society, right? So capital gets channeled in ways over-channeled, misallocated, but generate some decent long-term possibilities or platform capabilities for others to build upon, right? And so sometimes they have societal value, even if it tortures investor capital in the process. So you don't want to be part of that torching, but you can understand why they actually do good for society. I mean, the classic example that I like to use is fiber optics, right? And then 99, 2000, we built all these fiber optics companies and most, a lot of them went bankrupt, know, Global Crossing, Level 3, all these companies that, that laid a bunch of uh, fiber all over the place to enable high-speed internet, upon which business models like Netflix grew, right? I mean, you couldn't have that without that. And yet the investors in one segment that allowed the infrastructure to get overbuilt, provided the overcapacity which enabled the low cost because there was overcapacity that allowed new business models to form on top of that. 
And so, you know, are SPACs going to cause that with, I don't know, an area like space? Will they lower launch costs? Will they generate more, you know, activity in outer space? Will they enable the commercialization of space? Will there be some winners in SPACs that are, you know, probably. Do we yeah, need to it, have 500 SPACs chasing a few? No. Yeah, the, the interesting um, thing I, I not struggle with, but I, I can keep it in my head and be okay with it is, you know, this concept in my mind of, you know, look, you have really expensive, large cap market weighted stock public in the US, fine. But the amount of innovation and amazing companies, particularly on the startup level, that I feel like you're seeing this sort of uh, American renaissance would be the wrong word, but because so many of these companies, and you can start with the late 90s, but then to the, the past decade of startup founders getting liquidity and then seeing the pollination across you know, them being startup investors and more people getting excited about that. You know, I love and hugely bullish on, uh, but my my nervousness is that people, um, you know, the the get drawn in right at the per perfect wrong time, which seems to be something we can never avoid. I mean, it's it's over yeah. and over and over and over again, and I don't know how uh, we can build the guardrails to avoid it. But it seems like if you look at these stocks as a percentage of household assets it has like an almost perfect correlation to future returns on the stock market. And we're um, second highest we've ever been right now. It's three months delayed. So we're probably already past it, given the market's up this year. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts. That's more just of a ramble. <laughs> it's more of a <laughs> rant than anything. No, look, I understand what you're saying, but I think the, the societal value argument is, a, is an interesting thing. I and mean, the innovation, I agree with what you're saying here, that that sort of thing. But uh, it is this uh, dynamic, I think you're right, that it can suck people in. I, you know, a lot of people say there's greed and fear. And as a bubble thinker, I obviously think in terms of greed and fear. But I also say regret kicks in too. So uh, greed, fear, and regret. So it's okay to be greedy sometimes. It's okay to be fearful sometimes. You want to try to be contrarian if possible. But the real power uh, that sort of becomes problematic is the regret that, oh my God, Meb just bought that SPAC and he made 200%, God dang it. I wanted to be in on that. Now I regret, I didn't do it with him, right? So regret, envy, jealousy, I don't know, call it what you, you want. You can say FOMO, you can say FOMO. FOMO, FOMO, yeah. In fact, that's what I call FOMO in my book in terms of how people, why people tend to do a lot of irrational things. You need to get on board, right? Um, but I, but more than FOMO, FOMO implies a proactive jumping in. It's that the fact that it's happened makes it more likely for others to go, like, you just made X percent. That is ridiculous. Now I want to get in. FOMO is, uh oh, I'm worried Meb's going to make X percent and I won't. Yeah. This I'm saying like, you've already made it. Now I'm annoyed. And so now I come in and then I'm the second layer. And then once you run out of people to join the party, it's over. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, Music stops. I think it's the Buffett, Buffett or Munger. I can't remember which one said it, probably Munger, um, where he said, you know, the it's not fear and greed as much as it's envy, which is exactly what we were talking oh, yeah. about. Like I, name I something worse sure. than your neighbor making money on uh, Dogecoin, right? Like that's literally <laughs> the worst thing that could happen on the planet or someone you don't like <laughs> making a ton of money. That's even worse. Um, so no, that's actually that better. I think he's, yeah. he's saying it more eloquently than I am. I, I'm dancing yeah. around. Danny Kahneman did some work on regret and some of his early work actually was around regret rather than the irrationality. So, you know, is it regret that people try to minimize? Is that the explanation for rationality? Is that everyone's literally trying to minimize regret? Um, and so that's be, greed, fear, and regret are how I think of it. But I think you're right. Munger's probably got a better description. Envy is probably more accurate. You know, you see this, like we, we love as institutional investors to kind of look down on retail and say, look how silly these guys are. And, but in reality, you know, this sort of herd behavior happens just as much in our world, just with more commas and fancier names and committees and everything else. Um, if you look at how the big institutions invest, they kind of all chase each other and, uh, and, and seemingly always do the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, you put out another great book and as a bridge 
maybe we could talk a little bit about you you touch on uh passive investing and its ascendance over the past you know 50 years love to hear your thoughts there and kind of um uh bridge over from this sort of herd mentality to how in the world can we start to think for ourselves and not just uh <laughs> just chase what our neighbors are doing yeah well look i mean i think from what I understand your views are, from what I've heard you say and, and read, et cetera, uh, I think you and I are aligned on this passive thing here. Passive investing is an attempt at minimizing costs. That's been the driving consideration. And by the way, cost is not what any investor goes into allocating capital for. You're not in there to minimize costs, you're in there to maximize returns. Costs come out of the returns, and so insofar as costs affect returns, yes, we want to think about it. Um, and I and I think that makes a lot of sense to think about costs, and one shouldn't blindly pay up for things which you can get cheaper. Um, so I'm I'm with you on that. The passive concern I have is this: passive investing was a really good idea when very few people were doing it, right? Because you could ride shotgun, if you will, on the research endeavors and the battling out that resulted in the price. Right. So people battle for prices, prices are accurate, we get to something, and there's this fundamental underlying premise upon which the entire passive investing edifice is built, which is prices are correct. And they're correct because you have active investors battling it out to determine a price. And so that's make that's logical. I believe it. It makes sense. Now, what happens when passive investing grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and grows, and grows as it has, suddenly the driver of prices is no longer a battling of active investors. It's flows, right? It's inflows and outflows and everything moves together. And you can see this in some of the correlation statistics within markets. You can see it in other data. Like the fact is passive investing is in fact distorting the price mechanism. And so this logic that you should, as a passive investor, be a price taker has inadvertently, and frankly, to, without the knowledge of most people who continue to participate, in it, turned into a logic of price making. Wait, I thought I was a price taker. Now I'm a price maker? Yes, you are. And in fact, when you throw on institutional capital with more commas, as you say, that exacerbates that problem. It doesn't make it easier doesn't make it less extreme, it makes it worse. And so the fundamental logic of passive investing is to buy and sell independent of price because price is right. But if, I mean, call me old school, but the idea of buying and selling independent of price is not something I'm genuinely comfortable with. I like the you idea know, of buy low, sell high. I think if you pulled the majority of investors that are invested in passive indexes market cap weight and to me that's the really only passive index you know it, the the term has been somewhat polluted over the past decade because uh people have co-opted passive just to mean anything rules-based so you could have a esg brazilian small tech passive fund and you know in my mind that that doesn't really what we're yeah. talking about but but if you were to poll most people and ask them if they actually knew what passive investing was, I think they would almost universally assume it has to do with the size of the company based on revenues or earnings or something mm. uh. tangible and fundamental. But in reality, it's literally just the price of the stock times shares outstanding. And if you were to ask people then, is that a reasonable investment methodology? I can't imagine anyone saying, that makes sense. Now it ends up, it works over time for lots of reasons, but is, is fairly suboptimal. And at times, and particularly with booms uh, and bubbles uh, can be severely distorted because there's no tether to fundamentals whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's um, even worse than that. I think there's a element of momentum embedded because of the market cap weighted, right? So the app incrementally, Apple's a huge component. Incrementally, there's inflows because for something having nothing to do with Apple. And so there's buying. Incrementally, Apple gets weighted slightly more in the index tonight compared to tomorrow, all else equal, which I get is not always, rarely the case, never is all else equal, but theoretically all else equal which means that tomorrow there's buying an Apple to get the waiting right, <laughs> right? And so there's this slightly ever so subtle momentum element to it that's based on flows. 
And, and the, the big takeaway in my mind, you know, so much is, is also to be aware of it, uh, be cognizant of it, be cognizant of it also in really anything, you know, so flows into anything change the valuations. A great example that, you know, the media is certainly talking about now is, is uh, Kathy Wood's ARC phenomenon where it's raised, you know, $50 billion. And so flows into what she owns is, of course, going to drive Yep. prices up just like when people get excited about india and china in the mid-2000s right drove those prices way up when it, when the endowments got and institutions got excited about buying commodities you know after the 2000 bust uh that drove prices up and some asset classes are a lot bigger than others and could absorb it better mm -hmm. uh than say maybe i don't know non-fungible tokens and people buying uh people buying art but <laughs> yeah it yeah. i think it's a useful uh because when the the opposite is true when the flows reverse the same effect happens right yep. and we've seen this a million times in history yep no the, these these in fact i think passive has now become because of its impact on flows and flows impact on prices uh has become a you know people call it boom bust you could just say it's a virtuous vicious logic right it's going to be virtuous higher flows more price action higher flows goes up prices etc until it doesn't until it doesn't and then when you get the opposite you can see that now it could be really profitable really profitable to get ahead of big flows if you see big flows coming or you can identify where there's going to be big tectonic shifts you can get ahead of that and that could be really, really, really uh, lucrative for, for those who do get ahead of it. Yeah, um, that's the sort of trend element that, you know, I think is is useful. The challenge for many people, of course, is they're trying to subjectively time when these things happen, which is, of course, really, really impossible or hard to do. I like coming into it with, you know, as a set of rules and uh, guide rails but that's just me um <laughs> yeah talk to me a little bit how are there some hacks or there's some ideas suggestions like how do we get away from this herd mentality how do we think for ourselves that we can apply to not just investments but but life in general yeah no thanks man for asking um it's interesting because the logic of that next book think for yourself came out of the logic from boom bustology and really just fun story so let me share it here if you don't mind um so I was running around the world talking to sovereign funds, talking to endowments, foundations, describing the boom bustology framework, talking about how China had overbuilt, et cetera. It's probably 2013, 14, 15. And um, an older gentleman in one of my speeches comes up after and says, hey, you know, Dr. Manshermani, I'd love to keep in touch. Can I get your contact? I'm fine. I give him my card. Um, thought nothing of it. He's probably in his 90s. Two years later, he calls me up, says, I want to talk to you. Remember, I met you at the conference. He says, oh, of course, sir. Yes, please. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, how are you doing? He says, I'm good. I just want to thank you. Why is that? I want to thank you because the framework you presented helped my wife and I navigate a cancer diagnosis. And I said, wait, what? I was talking about finance, bubbles, economics. What are you talking about? He said, no, you're not. You're not talking about that. And I was like, okay, let me just, my ears perked up. I was like, this guy's just reeking of wisdom, right? I want to listen. I want to learn. And he says, no, what you have is a framework for thinking about navigating uncertainty. You have a multi-lens logic that says every single approach is, in, is imprecise and incomplete. And so we took that same fundamental logic to thinking about how to navigate medical decision-making and it helped. So thank you. And I was like, wow, I then took a couple of years uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. And what came out of it was this idea that became the book Think for Yourself. Um, but but look, it's ultimately the same thinking process that I'm suggesting with the study of bubbles, multiple lenses, triangulation, and understanding that a generalist logic might prove better to helping you think about probabilistic phenomenon than a specialist logic. I mean, I realize this is going to be mostly audio for your audience here, but you know, I've got a fox that I keep here over my desk because a fox is a generalist, knows lots of little things. And it's my it's messy here, but nonetheless, down on the ground, 
I keep a little hedgehog because the hedgehog knows one big thing, but it's lower status in my world. Um, and so I, I think it's useful and constructive to think like that, regardless of what we're talking about, right? I mean, understand your perspective is limited, biased, and incomplete. I mean, I love reading David Foster Wallace because, you know, he's sort of a, a fabulous way to capture some of these things. Like he describes in, I forget one of his talks or one of his art, uh, stories or what have you, but like, we're all literally self-centered. We literally see the world from our eyes. Our perspective is based on where our head is and everything revolves around that. Well, understanding that that's not the complete story or picture can help you be, I think, slightly more humble and appreciative of the fact that there are other ways to see the world. Also, being a generalist, um, I think, helps you think for yourself because you're more open-minded to hearing other people's perspectives. Why is that? And I can't tell you the number of rooms I've walked in where I know right off the bat, everyone around the room knows more about something than I do. I don't know anything about any. I'm not an expert on anything, actually. Right. So when I got a microeconomist talking to me, so okay, I'm going to listen because like I know more than I do. A macroeconomist knows more than I do. A psychologist definitely knows more than I do. And I view myself, and this is sort of the, the sort of pulling it all together. Think of it as you're putting together a mosaic of the world or the worldview that you're trying to form. And you take the tiles from the experts who are useful, the specialists who have more domain knowledge than you do, but you're painting that mosaic or painting or putting together that mosaic, you know, I guess you don't paint it, putting the tiles in place, right? And so the phrase I use in the book is, you know, we have to learn to keep experts on tap, but not on top. So don't outsource your thinking, you know, take insights, but own the context. You know, it's, it's um, think of yourself as an interesting, because most people assume it it's, contrarian by nature, but not always. I mean, your, your conclusion could result that you're part of the herd, but it often will result in something that is uh, lonely, you know, and in having a, um, that feels scary and uncomfortable for many people, right? We're social animals. We want to be, um, you know, it's fun if you're watching a, a game, you know, or be cheering as part of the crowd, like that's in our genes somewhere. I'm a Broncos fan and uh, you know, unless you're like one of my short seller friends who's just wired differently, your brain just works differently. It's, it's, it's hard to stand apart from the crowd when that does result. But in many times, I think that is, is, uh, where often the real insight comes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so you're, go ahead. No, I said, I think you're right. I think sometimes, you know, it's interesting thinking for yourself doesn't mean contrarian, right? It, it can be contrarian need not be contrarian, right? So I think you're right. I, I agree with what you're saying there. Um, so in, the, in that vein, uh, thinking for yourself, I, I like to read your future predictions. Is that what it's called? Uh, <laughs> your forecasts, yeah. which I love that you, you end the piece, the last one, uh, quoting uh, Galbraith saying, uh, there's two types of forecasters, those who, don't, those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know, which if you, if you are on Twitter, uh, listeners, you, there's really only one type of forecaster, and that's they, they know the future perfectly. Uh, <laughs> pick out a couple. Tell me, what are some of, what's, what's going to happen in the next five years? And I like why that time frame. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, it's funny. I, was I had a call with some of my consulting clients this morning and it's corporate America, sort of traditional, big, real companies. And uh, they were talking to me about their five-year plan. And I was like, why do you guys have a five-year plan? And I said, well, you know, we sort of, it's our capitalist sort of tilt of our head to the Chinese and the communist systems of five-year plans. I don't know. <laughs> they didn't know good reason, right? Same reason. Why do I know five? I don't know. It's, there's not a really good reason other than I don't want it to be one year. I don't want it to be through. I need to look out further. And part of that is, I think when you're looking at long-term trends, you can actually possibly see signal with a little bit less noise. The short term gets very noisy, right? Yeah. Because randomness plays a larger role there. But over the longer term, we call it five years, possibly longer. I think some of these signals emerge. So I've been writing these predictions up as a tool for myself. They started really, maybe, as Vikram's going to take his ideas and congeal them, 
started in 2015, really to just help myself get my arms around, hey, how do I think about what's happening on that time frame? And so I started doing it in 2015. I've you know, done it every year since, and I put them out there publicly and let people comment and just go with them. Um, they've included topics such as, I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny, I had in 2015 in my first set of predictions, I said, uh, you know, the risk of a global pandemic would occur. Mm. I thought it was MERS, actually. I actually put MERS in, in parentheses with a little question mark there. Mm. Um, and uh, obviously it was COVID, but something like that. There, there are a whole bunch of things I talk about. Um, the ones that currently, uh, and I don't know whether they're the most recent one, but they've been in the last couple of years and I would say are worth thinking about that they are ideas that come to me through my process of trying to think for myself, connecting dots, looking at different perspectives. The first is India. People tend to really have binary feelings towards India. They love it. It's the next China, right? Tim Cook goes, well, I'm not convinced. The idea of farmers being taken to factories instead of five bushels of wheat, making 500 iPads, getting huge surplus, sharing it back with the, consumer, the worker who then becomes a consumer and you get a large middle class, that sort of development model, I don't think it's going to work in India. I don't think it's going to work for one reason. You got robots, you got technology, automated manufacturing. And so you may get manufacturing in India, but you're not going to necessarily get equivalent number of jobs. So that process of industrialization based development, I think that game's over, that gigs up, right? And so the result of that, as, excuse me, as a result of that, I think we haven't done the thinking you know, academically, or even just as a society about how to think about demographics properly. This idea that's still thrown out there, there's a demographic tailwind. What, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean when labor isn't a value? What labor ends up being a liability, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got lots of young people that used to be a real value, right? Okay. Cheap labor. Good. Throw a little bit of capital, labor plus capital, productivity. Fabulous. Well, hold on a sec. Now, what if I just need capital? I don't need as much labor. All that extra labor, cheap, is actually a liability. Now I got to find them jobs. There's nothing for them to do. Oh no! What do we do now? Uh, and so I think one of the real risks, from an economic development perspective, because of technology, because of demographics, etc., is India becomes a perennial disappointment, uh, and that has implications uh, in a whole bunch of ways. Now, interestingly enough, I think India's got a really interesting geopolitical spot playing off this US-China rivalry. We got some stuff going on with Russia here. You know, Pakistan, maybe India can sort of, hey, we're the world's largest democracy, come help us. So the geopolitics of India is sort of, yeah, a little bit confusing to me, honestly. Um, it's above my pay grade, I can't figure it out. But- Yeah, keep going. But the, but the demographics, technology, and economic outlook there seems to point to headwinds more than tailwinds. So that's one idea that I've been talking a little bit about, about India and how I think that plays out. Um, it's interesting because I, I think a lot of people, you know, the, the common accepted belief is that demographics are, you know, destiny, that it's a massive asset of having all these uh, young people and less old people. Like that's, that seems like an almost universally held belief. I'm going to suggest the opposite. And I, when I think for myself, as I try to do, yeah. I'm going to say the opposite, right? Yeah. So most people think that India's got this demographic engine behind it. Lots of young people, lower, small, smaller percentage of old people, less dependency, et cetera. But they're missing the point. You got to get jobs for them. And the, the sort of economic engines are changing. Whereas you look at Japan, you say, oh my God, all these old people, no labor coming in. Let me ask you this. Where are robots and automation going to be less socially disruptive? You can bring robots into Japan, no problem. Robots are increasingly the equivalent of labor. And so you can change your demographic pyramid however you want. You got holes because you're upside down, fill it in. It's just, as you get more technological innovation, that becomes increasingly possible. And so our whole study of demographics and how it interacts with economics and you know the, the quote unquote destiny may in fact be 180 degrees wrong. At this point, I'm not sure. I'm still doing work on it, but that's what that that's one uh, one of the ideas that I talk about in my predictions. The other one that I think it might be fun and interesting to talk about here with your audience is um, 
as a result of this US-China rivalry, I do think all these supply chains are shifting back or getting shorter and, and sort of moving. And the storyline is pretty simple, right? I'm a global manufacturer, let's say I'm an American company, and I get this little piece, this component, this widget made in China, uh, and it goes through a whole bunch of other countries, but it ends up here, and it costs me $5, and it's a key component. Then there's the trade war, and it says, oh, no, this $5 widget is going to be $25 now because of the tariffs. It's okay, it's disruptive, pinching my profits, but I'll adapt, I'll do what I can, but I'm a little nervous about my supply chain there. Then COVID comes. Now I can't even get the widget, five or $25 a widget, not available. Okay, well, that doesn't make me feel good. I got to think about supply. Chain. Throw on top of it the ESG mandates. Well, people are saying I need to have a shorter supply chain because supply chain length is correlated with a carbon footprint. Okay, so now I need to bring the supply chain closer to home. Well, there was tax arbitrage reasons. They used to add the value there because US had higher taxes, add the value there, lower value add here. Therefore, well, hold on, the US just lowered tax rates. Now there's no tax arbitrage. That's okay. There's labor cost arbitrage, costs a lot of money. Well, the labor component of these goods is falling because technology is doing more of the work. So that value is gone. National security implications now kick into play. US China rivalry, whether it's tech component, backdoors, firmware. Uh oh, you know what? We're heading towards not just supply chains shifting, as I think is well thought out and well discussed. I think we may even be headed to two separate global economies two separate global economies. There'll be a Chinese-led ecosystem and a US-led ecosystem. And if you don't believe it, I've run around and I've talked to countries, uh, you know, senior government officials in different countries, and nobody likes this idea. They want to be able to play the Chinese market and also have US political and military coverage, if you will. And then I ask them, okay, that's fine. It's a great ideal. I know you want it. What telecom equipment are you installing for 5G, okay, maybe you're gonna keep this 6G, 7G. At some point you're gonna choose. And when you choose, you're gonna choose an ecosystem in that process, like it or not. So anyway, that's modern, another. Yeah, I was gonna say the modern Betamax uh, question. Uh, I was hoping you were gonna talk about URSA major technologies and UFOs. We'll <laughs> save that till the next conversation. Um, uh, Vikram, you got a curious mind. Uh, you've done a lot of great writing. As you look to the horizon, what's got you uh, excited today? Anything scratching your head about? Any projects you're working on? Any new classes, seminars? What's uh, what's on the frontier? Yeah, so it's fun. Uh, thanks. Good question. Uh, I am teaching a class right now at Harvard um, called Humanity and Its Challenges. And it's a class that looks at the world's toughest problems by using, surprise, surprise, my sort of approach, which is multiple lenses, multiple angles, but also a systems thinking approach, which is to incorporate feedback loops. So when you push here, not just, hey, look at what I did by pushing, where's the reaction force coming and where's that surfacing and what is that gonna cause, right? So it's thinking not only through multiple lenses, but also feedback loops to understand where some of the impacts may surface. Um, so some of the cases, and again, I've been teaching this class at Harvard since 2017, actually January 17. Yeah, um, we looked at global pandemic risk, which, you know, students laughed at in 17, 18, 19. They don't laugh anymore. Um, we look at technology and jobs. We look at capitalism and inequality. We look at privacy and data. Uh, we looked at uh, a whole bunch of things, energy uh, dynamics in the environment, climate change. We've looked at space and the, uh, the multiple dimensions of space. I find that fascinating, whether it's commercialization, you know, you mentioned Ursa Major, but, uh, you know, the lower launch costs, what is that going to do? Um, and what's happening with uh, not only, uh, you know, commercialization and, and that kind of stuff in space, but also like sovereignty. Like if someone goes and starts mining the moon, like, who can you just, is that just a free for all? Is this like, we just go take, or is there some governance structure that's going to emerge um, and going further? So there's technological innovation, there's economic issues, there's political issues, uh, there's social and moral issues. Who gets to go to space first, right? I mean, is it, is it going to be Elon Musk and, and Richard Branson that get to go take their joy rides in space because they've got the capital to do so? Yeah, probably. But, you know, is it, is at some point, when does it become equal access? And then, you know, 
just because you asked, I got I to gotta drizzle this last tidbit in about aliens. Um, you know, uh, there's a colleague of mine, I don't know him well, I don't know him really at all, at Harvard, uh, Avi Loeb, who wrote a book called Extraterrestrial. She talked about uh, something, and I'm not going to pronounce it right, but Aua Muamua, which is this um, structure that came into our solar system and left. And it had luminosity that su suggested it was shinier than uh, rocks. It didn't have a tail of exhaust like some comets do. It, um, you know, didn't have a shape that we've seen before. It left at a speed that is not accounted for by its incoming speed and gravitational move. So the math didn't work. And it's believed it could be, you know, it's possibly some form of alien technology. And the reason I bring that up in, and when I think about space is the impact, if it was determined to be, alien technology, I think could really help all of us here on this planet, look beyond our differences and find some of our similarities, right? I mean, suddenly it's not me, Vikram versus you, Meb, or me, an American versus them, the Chinese, or et cetera. It's we, the humans, <laughs> you know? And that I think could be socially really powerful, whether or not we ever interact with aliens or, 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 or whether even that there is any, are any aliens, right? So, sounds like, uh, sounds like the plot of uh, Will Smith's Independence Day. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, uh, I saw that at a drive-in in Colorado. Drive-ins yeah. kind of had a nice little renaissance. I mean, when it came out, by the way, uh, drive-ins had a nice renaissance here during the pandemic. That was like one of the only things you could do in Los Angeles for that period when everything was totally shut down. What do we go see? Uh, Ratatouille. I got a three-year-old, oh. so my 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 film options are limited. You know that that concept. What you're talking about? Uh, first of all, there'd be an interesting book or series uh, if you were to work on it. I actually used to think of um, someone like a really interesting book would would be grab fifty thought leaders and ask them a simple question: Is what's uh, what's the best idea in the world? Like to change the world, like, what would you do? You got one idea, what would it be? And how would you implement it? Um, I'm sure you'd get some pretty diverse, or what, like, what's the biggest problem? How do you fix it? Uh, yeah. Some pretty diverse opinions. So I don't want to yeah. work on it. If you do, let me know, uh, I'll, uh, I'll contribute. Um, yeah. Vigran, what's been your most memorable investment? Anything come to mind that uh, over your career, good, bad, in between? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was a kid from a lower middle-class family went to college on financial aid as, you know, maxed out on the college loans, et cetera. And in 1993, I remember meeting a guy in New Haven, uh, Frank, Frank Bashinsky is his name. I can't believe I remembered it. Uh, anyway, Frank was a great guy, got to know him well. And he was working on this company. He's a computer scientist guy. We're going to this company says, you know what, we're going to solve this problem. There's a gigantic ticking time bomb. And he had like this, this religious fervor to him about this problem. And this problem was the year 2000 bug that's in all the software. Mm -hmm. And we're figuring out how to identify where the year 2000 bugs are. And we're going to automate that identification process, which is going to avoid massive pain and companies are going to pay us. And so this was a little penny stock. And, you know, I spent a lot of time getting to know them, figuring it out. And then I borrowed on credit cards money. And I went to the Fidelity physical location in New Haven, went literally in there. And I invested in this thing, um, watched it like a hawk, would like talk to him and the CEO, like on an almost daily basis. What's the update? What's the update? Because this borrowed money. Like it's, I don't have it. And I'm on financial aid. Anyway, long story short, it worked out beautifully. Um, this company called Aladar software back then. Um, but Aladar, uh, went from, I don't know, I think I bought it like 20 cents and I think I sold a bunch of it a couple of years after graduation for 20 bucks and got myself out of student debt. So how'd you, how'd you have <laughs> the fortitude to hold? Because I mean, this is actually a great example. I mean, how many, um, young investors, with the debt you mentioned, um, something doubles. It goes from 20 to 40 cents. I mean, elated, like that's the happiest you've probably ever been. And God forbid you held it till it goes to two bucks. That's yeah. a, you know, a, a 10 bagger. Yeah. Uh, you're rich, it's a hit the lottery basically. Um, this is something we talk a lot about where you look at these compounders over time that, that eventually get to five, 10, 50, 100 bagger status. It wasn't a smooth ride. 
That's right. What was the experience like? Do you remember? Were you like checking this every day, walking down the oh, fidelity, harassing yeah. everyone? Yeah, no, you have to use phone calls to call in. You have to type in the ticker, but that's right. You have to in, in one and then like three, three, three to get the next ticker. Four, that yeah. was like the big innovation, by the way, when you could actually do the touch tone. This, this was pre pre internet. Some people forget that. Yeah. Like 92, like, you know, my kids are like, what'd you do? I, I didn't have email then. So how'd you yeah. meet people? I said, I didn't have a cell phone. You told people you're going to meet them at five o'clock you went there they weren't there stare, at right delete. like what do you mean <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> what no so it's uh, interesting the psychology comes into play and i think this actually helped me um tremendously it was very simple i waited once once it doubled i took half my money off and i paid off the credit card loan that, that was it i mean and then i've said all right now it's just it's out there it's out there and it's either going to have an impact or it was house money. So the psychology problem, which actually was probably imprudent in retrospect, I probably bore a lot more risk than I shouldn't have, actually. It worked out, but you know sometimes things work out for the wrong reasons. This was probably a lot of luck after the initial success uh, that, let you, that let me capture more because I just stuck it out because I was like, oh, it's house money. What happens if I lose all? So what? Right. But the yoloing, reality, it wasn't, yoloing it wasn't before yoloing was a thing. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't house money, right? Yeah. It was, it was my money at that point. Yeah. 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 It wasn't yeah. house money, but I was like, oh, house money. Uh, you know, I was what, geez, I guess I was uh 22, 24 at that point. I was selling it and I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread because I'd now got rid of all my loans. Yeah. I got to zero. Oh. Hey, that was a win. <laughs> There's Balance no better sheet, feeling. <laughs> No better feeling than uh, clearing clearing that debt out. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Bigram, this has been a blast. Where do people go? They want to read your predictions for next year. They want to learn about UFOs. What's the best spot? <laughs> you know, so I'd say, look, my website's probably the easiest place to connect with me. It's just www.manshramani, M-A-N-S-H-A-R-A-M. A N I.com, but I'm also on LinkedIn. And in fact, for those that are really curious, my LinkedIn profile has a hundred and some odd articles I've written about a lot of the topic we've talked about today. I put my predictions up there. It's actually formatted a little nicer than my own website. So it might be easier on the eyes to go find the content there. Uh, and I'm happy to connect with people on LinkedIn there, but I'm also on Twitter. It's just my last name, Manshur Amani. We'll add all the show note uh, listeners links to the show notes, mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. Vikram, thanks so much for joining us. It was a blast. Awesome. Thanks, Meb.